Welcome everyone to challenge run number six here on my YouTube channel. Today we're asking the question, can you beat XCOM 2 War of the Chosen using only ranges in combat? Ranges are a close range, close range unit equipped with sword and shotgun. Their skill tree is a little bit weird, but one branch is basically focused on melee attacks, while the other is focused on stealth abilities. They're really powerful units, so I'm expecting this run to be easier than the specialist only run. Though I think we will encounter some of the same problems we had with the Templar only run, having to get in close to attack the enemy always runs the risk of activating more pods. However, you can actually equip rangers with assault rifles rather than shotguns. I don't blame you if you didn't know this, even if you've played XCOM 2. Outside of a run like this, there's really no reason to ever give your ranger a rifle over a shotgun, at least not that I can think of. But in a solo class challenge, we may end up doing just that to give us some longer range support. Sorry, Bradford. Now the rules are the same as always, we're playing on Commander Difficulty, we're playing on Honest Man, so we can only reload for glitches and misclicks, and we can obviously only use ranges in combat. And mandatory Twitch plug here, I stream these runs in full on Twitch, so if you're interested in that, please follow me over there, the link is in the description. And if you enjoy this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel, it really helps me out. Thanks very much. So to begin the run, I replaced the usual starting soldiers with 12 rangers, and even on the first mission, there's something really noticeable about the rangers. See, the normal assault rifles you have on this mission do 3 to 5 damage, but with our rangers shotguns, we deal 4 to 6 damage. This means, as long as our shot hits, we're guaranteed to take a regular trooper down in one hit. This is a really big leg up for us on this mission. Now the footage you're watching is actually the fourth attempt on stream. And it looks really easy, right, as we mow down those advent fools? Well, it really comes down to luck. In all the previous attempts, both advent pods were right on top of each other, making it impossible to activate them one at a time. But when you can get them on their own, like we did in this run, it's actually a cakewalk. We clean up the remaining bad guys, and there's another real positive with the rangers here. In the early game at least, an adjacent and flanked enemy is a 100% chance to hit. With the specialists, I think it was only 88%, and everyone who watched that video knows how catastrophic that 88% chance turned out to be. Oh no! Oh no! Oh damn it! Damn it! Oh, okay. Maybe you'll do five damage. Please do five damage, please. What? Oh, no. Oh, man, KJ, I blame you for this, man. Oh, no. Oh, no. How? It was right in front of their face. We build the usual suspects in the form of a flashbang and the resistance ring. Then I get this weird glitch where the clock is still ticking away on the strategic layer, but I can't actually do anything. And this is why we don't play on Iron Man. I restart the game, and the loading screen shows the Warlock, so I'm guessing he's going to be the first Chosen who shows up. Again. How wonderful. So the first Gorilla Op is up, and we're sending Red Devil and Killjoy. Let's hope they fare better than the last video. I consider running into Slash at the first pod, but I decide against it. This turns out to be very fortunate, as there's another pod nearby that we would have activated. And I'm expecting this to be an ongoing problem in the campaign, having to weigh up being in close to maximise our accuracy, versus having to hang back and not activate more pods. On top of the two pods that are, well, on top of each other, we've only got four turns to hack the objective. I decide to run around the pods and try to secure the objective first. However, as you would expect if you're familiar with XCOM 2, multiple pods camp themselves right on the objective. I disorientate them all with a flashbang, but were only able to take down a single enemy. 
Even better, the pod from the start of the mission wanders over, and now I think every single enemy on the map is active at the same time. Also, did you know captains can still mark targets while disoriented? So with one turn left, we hack the objective, and then turn our attention to the bad guys, who have just called in some reinforcements. What is it with getting terrible luck on the second mission lately? Again, we can only take down a single enemy, and Advent just brought in three more. Red Devil and Metla both get hit. I consider evacing, but Leeson is panicked by a sectoid, and I don't want to leave him behind. We take down two troopers, plus a zombie that one of the sectoids raised. I've honestly lost track of how many enemies are left at this point. I think it's one trooper, one captain, and two sectoids, but I could be wrong. Mettler also gets panicked on the next turn, but we thankfully don't take any more damage. Mettler and Red Devil will not survive another hit. On our turn, we're able to take down a single sectoid, which also destroys the zombie it had raised. The last trooper then hits Red Devil, and she goes down in the second mission. Again. I'm starting to think maybe she's cursed or something. Oh wait, there's two troopers left, and that one just hit Killjoy. This is brutal. We take down a trooper and captain, leaving only one sectoid and one trooper, I'm pretty certain. The sectoid is thankfully on fire, taking burning damage, and it decides to fall back rather than attack. The trooper fires at Leeson, and now no one on our team is at full health. We need to finish this quickly, which is exactly what we do with some melee attacks. And I have to say, that was some real garbage. It was either engage the pod slowly and not make it to the objective in time, or rush to the objective and engage all the pods at once. Not to mention the reinforcements. It was really a no-win situation, so losing only one soldier isn't too bad, all things considered. Also, the barracks double-up glitch is back, and there's a second Red Devil waiting for us. So we'll just pretend she survived those wounds, and is actually good to keep fighting. Now here we usually get a horde mission where you have to race to the VIP and then race back to the evac zone, but not the case this time. Instead, we get one of those missions where you have to find the VIP and then fight your way through both Lost and Advent to get to the evac. Usually I find these missions more difficult, but this one goes really well, and we actually get our first promotion. Phantom and Blademaster are both really good abilities, but I opt to go with Phantom, this allows Monocle to start every mission concealed, even when you normally wouldn't, and that will include the retaliation mission that will be coming up very shortly. Having a concealed unit who can scout ahead can be really useful in keeping your squad out of trouble. War of the Chosen made concealment ranges a lot less valuable, since we now have Reapers which do the same thing, just way better. But in the base game, and for this challenge run, Concealment ranges are really great to have. Cat returns from a covert op and has also earned a promotion. I give her Blade Master, making her sword attacks deal more damage, as well as being more accurate, as I figure that could be good to have on the Retaliation mission too. And speaking of the Retaliation mission, here we go. Of course the game deploys Monocle, the man with concealment, at the back of the squad. This seems to happen a lot, and I really hate it. Giving us some control over where our units deploy was probably my favourite thing that they added in Chimera Squad. I really hope a similar mechanic appears in XCOM 3, so we can deploy the scouts at the front of the group, not the back. Anyway, the loading screen was indeed being an honest man. Get it? Get it? Okay, I'll show myself out for that one. Anyway, the Warlock is here. Even better, he has immunity to melee attacks. Ah! So, I guess Cat having Blade Master isn't going to help us very much after all. The Warlock also regenerates lost health. These are some awful abilities for him to have so early in the game. We meet the first pod, and Monocle's concealment is immediately blown when he's flanked. So his promotion was useless as well. Well, I shouldn't be too quick to judge. The good news is Cat is guaranteed to one-shot Sectoids with Slash now, so we take it down easily. 
only to activate another one right after. I'm debating whether to put Monocle into cover or to shoot. Since Drifter is flanked already, I figure leaving Monocle out of cover too is no big deal. Someone is getting flanked regardless. We take the 44% shot and we hit. This is actually huge, as now there's only a single sectoid left active. Even better, it ignores the flanking shot it has on us and raises a zombie. We can't celebrate our good fortune for too long though, as the warlock runs in to ruin our day entirely. Once he's done monologuing, which feels like it lasts for several weeks, he hits Monocle with a daze. Much better than a mind control, so we'll roll with it. Now after much fiddling around with placement, Drifter is able to just barely throw his grenade far enough to hit the sectoid. We can't finish it off though, and it panics Monocle. The Warlock then mind controls Cat, so just like that, half our team is gone. I charge Drifter out to finish the sectoid in what may very well be a valiant last stand for him, and then use the flashbang on Cat. Monocle gets dazed for three turns, I think, which is just absurd, but Cat thankfully misses the civilian she fires at. I try to melee the trooper the warlock has summoned in, but it hangs on with one HP. Neither failed, nor the revived Monocle can hit it. Oh, and the faceless activates. This is looking grim. Though in better news, the trooper takes cover on a burning car, so he'll be gone next turn. The Warlock then mind controls Monocle, but that does give us back control of Cat on our turn. And the Faceless doesn't really do anything. In some ways that's actually more disconcerting than if it was coming after us. Like what's going through its head as it just stands there menacingly. It's really disturbing. Anyway, we take it out with Cat and Drifter. While with Failed, we just run as far away from Monocle as we possibly can. The plan seems to work, sort of, as Monocle focuses on the civilians, not us. I know I shouldn't be happy about that, but I'm really, really happy about that. The Warlock mind controls Cat, which again gives us back control of Monocle, but he's on the other side of the map and totally useless to us at this point. Failed and Drifter charge in and begin shooting, but he recovers health at the end of each turn, so the amount of damage the two of them are doing is really not a lot. Also, they're standing near some gas canisters, and Cat lobs a grenade right into them. Both men go down, and it's now Monocle versus Cat and the Warlock. Well, Monocle immediately gets mind controlled, and it's game over. See, we would gain control of Cat on our turn, but for the Warlock's turn, he actually gets to control both soldiers, so the game reads that as us having no troops left, and the mission is over. And so here, I actually decide to restart the campaign. We failed the mission, and we've lost five soldiers right off the bat, not to mention those who are injured. Now, usually in these videos, I only show you footage of the winning run, so I thought I'd try something new here for a couple of reasons. A, because I wrote all the script for the failed attempt, having forgotten that it was a failed attempt, and I don't want all that work to be for nothing. But B, and more importantly, it shows why the Warlock can be so horrid as the first chosen to show up. I've spoken a couple of times about how I hate facing this guy in the early game, and hopefully this demonstrates why. So anyway, take two, let's make this quick. The first mission, we spam some grenades from outer line of sight to whittle down the enemy's forces before moving in and mowing them down. And the highlight here has to be DJ scoring a crit and one-shotting the captain. Fail does take some damage, but thankfully there are no casualties, we're coming back with a bang. Flashbang, check. Resistance ring, check. The second mission is another neutralize the field commander, and Red Devil actually survives this time. Oh yes, I've got a good feeling about this run. Third mission is a rescue the VIP from the Horde. This one's a success too. Okay, so now for the retaliation mission. We actually haven't obtained a single promotion this time around, 
I guess because we didn't take out any advent on that third mission, as it was only lost this time, we didn't gain as much XP. But those promotions really didn't help us that much last time anyway, so let's just see how we go. First pod is a trooper and a sectoid, but we're only able to take down the trooper. And now the moment of truth, which chosen are we going to face this time? Oh dear. There is some good news that he's at least not immune to melee damage this time. And just as an aside, I know I pronounce the word melee really weird, but it's how I've pronounced it my whole life, so you'll just have to roll with it. I hope it's not too annoying for anybody watching. Anyway, we wipe out the sectoid and push on. The warlock plays his usual game of throwing zombies at us, but they only slow us down. They're not a major threat. However, we do stumble into a faceless, which is much more threatening. We're still able to take it out, and the good part of it being gone is we now know all the remaining civilians are safe to move up to. We run through a priest and a trooper, and then the warlock appears. Alright, we're back for revenge. Let's do the- Oh, he hit us with a mind scorch immediately. Well, it's still better than a mind control, but he's probably going to use that next turn. Yep. He used it next turn. So I attack the Warlock with the three soldiers we have left. My plan is to ignore Killjoy and hope he goes for a civilian over us. I know it's a grim thought, but we're pretty desperate here. Well, never mind. The Warlock summons a Spectral Stun Lancer. This puts him into stasis, which breaks the mind control on Killjoy. We one-shot the Lancer and then charge the Warlock. A couple of point-blank shotgun rounds to the face and we've defeated him. So that went much better than last time. I think the main differences between this mission and the failed one were that A, the Warlock didn't have melee immunity, and B, the terrain and pot activations were a lot more forgiving. We weren't running the gauntlet over a couple of skinny bridges while enemies rained down hellfire all around us. So who knows, we might even win this run. It's only attempt number five. I've got a good feeling, and those skirmishers are probably feeling pretty smug about things right now. And some more good news, we have four promotions. My plan is to go with one or two Phantom Rangers per squad, and put Blade Master on the rest. It's soon time for a Gorilla Op. Now, the reward for this one is a Sharpshooter, which is really useless, but the Dark Event causes a risk of capture on all Covert Ops, which would be quite annoying. So we kick things off by grenading a Sectoid and Stun Lancer through a roof. And yes, I've officially decided grenading is a legitimate verb from now on. Between the nade and the fall damage, the enemies are on very little HP, and we wipe them out. I push forward way faster than I should, as we are racing the turn timer but it thankfully pays off and we make it to the truck housing the device to hack without any bad pod activations. And the conga line formation can help with this. If you're like me, it feels unnatural leaving your soldiers out of cover, but a single line formation can help when trying to avoid pod activations. If the front soldier doesn't activate anything, it's very unlikely that the ones behind them will. Once we move around the truck, we have a Stun Lancer and Priest. Chan one-shots the Stun Lancer, which is awesome, but we can't hit the Priest. I don't know why I didn't just hit its cover with some grenading. I guess I wasn't that worried about it. <laughs> I should be worried though, as it flanks Chan, but thankfully only goes for stasis. However, on the alien turn, another pod shows up. Chan is in stasis, and Cat is busy hacking the objective, so we've only got two soldiers to work with this turn. I flashbang the trooper and priest, deliberately avoiding the sectoid. See, when it's flashbanged, yep, flashbanged is now an adjective, all it can do is shoot. You're actually better off leaving it alone to use its psionic attacks, as they're generally not as dangerous. However, my plan fails as the sectoid decides to shoot anyway, and down goes Chan. See, she was flanked, and we couldn't move her to safety due to the stasis, so the priest and sectoid both targeted her. There really wasn't much I could do to avoid that one. Sorry about that, Chan. We finish off the pod without taking any further damage. 
But the really crummy part is that we don't have a Chan clone in the recruitment pool, so she's actually gone for good. Oh, and check out what Bradford has to say as we make a poster honouring her. With a mug like that, you might get Advent to surrender after all. Bradford man, what is wrong with you? Have some respect for the deceased. We finish research on magnetic weapons, but we can't actually build any shard guns yet as we're short an engineer. You need two of them to build mag weapons, and we only have one. And we barely have any intel, so I couldn't buy one from the black market, even if I wanted to. And come to think of it, how the heck is the black market selling human beings into XCOM service? That seems pretty dodgy. First supply raid is up next, and we have the Savage sit rep, meaning beast-like enemies are going to be on this mission. And getting this sit rep on the first supply raid is actually amazing, and you'll see why in a moment. But in the meantime, I take a second flashbang and a whole squad of Blade Masters. No concealed soldiers on this one. And check out our first pod, Two Faceless. Now, only four enemies are included in the Beast group. Faceless, Berserkers, Chrysalids, and Stun Lancers. I'm not really sure why Stun Lancers are included. Maybe they can prod the Beasts into line with their baton. I don't know. Or is it Batten? Whatever. Anyway, the important part is that at the first supply raid, the force level will be too low for Chrysalids and Berserkers. That means you're going to have a whole map of just Faceless and Stun Lancers. Now while that may seem scary, because it is, if you can beat the mission, you'll be sitting on a giant pile of Faceless corpses, which means you're going to have way more Mimic Beacons than you're supposed to, and the rest of the campaign is going to be made a lot easier. So even if it means losing soldiers, we want to win this one at all costs. So we start with a flashbang, and this is the reason I bought an extra one. Regular grenades won't do much to Faceless, who don't use cover, but flashbangs will reduce their movement. Because they're melee only, this means if you need to fall back and shoot while they chase you, you can do that and give yourself a bit of extra breathing room. Now here, I was too close with Failed and he takes a hit. The worst part is his cover is destroyed, but thankfully the Stun Lancer still misses him with its shot. On our next turn, we take out our second Faceless and the Stun Lancer while hitting the remaining with another Flashbang. The Faceless can't do anything to us at this point, and here, the importance of Blade Master comes into play. With the extra damage on our melee attacks, each Faceless is a guaranteed two-shot with our swords. Now given there's two Faceless, and we have four soldiers, you can probably do the maths. However, there is another pot out there, and we're now out of flashbangs. So at this point, all we can do is Overwatch creep super slowly, we really want the enemy to activate on their turn, so we can do a bit of extra damage with Overwatch. This mission would be much easier if we had shard guns, but we have to work with what we have. Now sadly, we don't activate the enemy on their turn. And they have a Stun Lancer, which is the worst case scenario, as I'm wanting to use the roof with no cover to give us an aim boost. Cover doesn't make much difference against Faceless, but the Stun Lancer has a gun, so standing out in the open is probably not the best strategy. But I choose to leave the boys standing out of cover anyway. I figure it's only one gun, and they should be able to survive one hit. I use Red Devil to lead the bad guys back towards the rest of the squad who are on Overwatch. We only connect with a single shot, and we roll minimum damage, so pretty lousy luck on that one. But thankfully the Faceless are too far away to attack, and the Lancer misses with its attack. So it's kind of crunch time at this point, we need to inflict a big damage this turn, or we're going to get wiped out. We start off with a grenade to hit all three enemies, as well as damaging the Lancer's cover. Now here Red Devil misses an 87% shot, and this is a really terrible moment to be failing so spectacularly. Failed also misses his shot, so we could only take out the Lancer. Two Faceless are now coming in, but I have moved off the shanty roof, 
Faceless will destroy roofs, so it's better to be on the ground when they attack, and they're close enough now that we really don't need the aim buff anyway. Well, at least that's what I thought until Red Devil missed a really easy shot. Their attack on Leeson misses, and Drifter survives his. We then hit back with Slash, and finish them off. And that's six faceless corpses we've picked up, meaning up to three Mimic Beacons for us, super early in the game. It was definitely worth the injuries we took, and even better, we've got a couple of Sergeants, which means Squad Size 1 upgrade for us. The next council mission will give us an engineer as a reward, which will allow us to build shard guns, so we really need this mission to be a success also. And here we're able to make use of Phantom, we take out the first pod with the majority of the team, while Hoffman is able to keep concealment and continue scouting ahead. So Hoffman spots a pod, and we're able to hide behind a door, and then, at the start of our turn, open it up to surprise the enemies. And they must be really surprised, because the pod doesn't even scatter. They just stand there. We use our soul grenade, three of our soldiers are carrying mimic beacons instead, but the purifier also explodes, causing more damage to the rest of the pod. We take the remaining enemies out with ease and push on to the VIP. Now this is one of those missions where you have to defend the position while you await evac. We set up Overwatch, which our rangers aren't all that good at with their short range weapons, but we do have the high ground, and the enemies are dropping in very close to us, so we're able to take out one sectoid. We clean up the rest of the reinforcements on our turn, I do have to break Hoffman's concealment to do it, but being concealed at this point isn't really that useful anyway. And this does raise an issue, you still want your phantom rangers to be getting kills when it's safe to do so, if they don't take out any enemies, they will level up very slowly, and get outpaced by the rest of the team. So let's just take a moment here to admire Hoffman's handiwork. She shot past DJ to take out this sectoid. This image is a thing of beauty. I need to hang it up on my wall or something. I love this. We clean up the reinforcements as they come, and book it out of there as soon as evac arrives. We actually didn't use any of our three mimic beacons. Our rangers are doing pretty well so far, and they're about to be doing even better as we can now build shard guns. We get ambushed here, and I really hate ambush missions. I've just played so many of them over the years, and they're always the same. But regardless, I know I hardly ever use soldier bonds, but I did in this run, with Leeson and Killjoy. Now I can't imagine why Killjoy would want to be hanging out with a man like Leeson, but each to their own, I'm not judging. Anyway, Killjoy has concealment, and Leeson is out of range to get to this trooper. So instead of having to lose concealment with Killjoy, we give Leeson an extra action to finish the trooper off. And that was actually really helpful. I do need to make more use of bonds. Now check out this misclick. I'm trying to click on the balcony here, and the game sends Killjoy running miles away into the shipping yard below. This is the other reason we don't play Iron Man. I mean, I've had misclicks before, but it's usually on the next tile over, this one wasn't even in the same stratosphere. Anyway, we do eventually blow KJ's concealment to help with lost control, but we evac out with no issues. We also build arc blades before the next mission, so now our swords are doing more damage in addition to our guns. And even the warlock showing up doesn't cause us any problems. This has given us the power spike we needed. And before too long, we also have Predator Armor, which buffs our HP. It also means we can carry two items, so no more having to choose between grenades and mimic beacons. Things continue going well, and before long we have a Neutralize the Field Commander mission. The Lost are also present on this one, and I've brought along the Skulljack, as we do need to be progressing the story research. You all know that I can be a bit slack with that sometimes. We're camped out on a bridge overlooking the old town. It's doubtful any pods are going to patrol into us up here, so I send Monocle down to blow our concealment and get the party started. A couple of sectoids and a whole lot of lost to greet us. We mow through everything in our way. Our rangers really are kicking it here. We soon find the field commander, and he randomly has a mech with him for some reason. I'm not sure I've ever seen that before, 
The field commander takes a whopping two shots to put down, and with him out of the way, we can now take our time cleaning up the rest of the enemies, and it probably will take a fair bit of time given how many lost are about this map. We activate a captain and move in on it, activating one of our many mimic beacons to distract it. And now comes the Skulljack. And the Codex spawns with a whole building between us and it. That doesn't really seem fair, I do have to say. Now things start to go a little pear-shaped here. A new pod of a Viper and a Trooper show up, while the Codex hits almost our whole team with a Psionic Bomb. I'm honestly not too worried about the Psionic Bomb though, as it doesn't affect our swords, we can still use those to attack. And as you would probably expect, we use a lot of swords to attack next turn. We can only finish a single trooper, but another Mimic Beacon keeps us safe from enemy counterattacks. Monocle scores a crit on the Codex that does 11 damage. This is pretty good because when the Codex only has a single point of HP left, it can't actually spawn a clone, which is good for us. Leeson then lands the final blow, and we've taken out 30 enemies without so much as a scratch. So hopefully this shows you that the Rangers are doing very well. We unlock modular shotguns, which will give them an extra weapon mod slot, so that may come in quite useful. More time passes, and we're now rocking plasma grenades, as well as having an exosuit for Monocle. Now, this is our first mission in the Hunter's territory, so I'm expecting him to show up. And check out stealth in this game. These civilians don't notice a massive soldier with blade and shotgun climbing up the wall right next to them. I love this game. And we actually make it to the VIP without losing concealment. I wasn't particularly trying to do that, and I certainly didn't expect to, but hey, I'll take it. We break the prisoner out and blow a hole in the wall of the building as the evac zone is just on the other side. And even though grabbing the VIP will break concealment, KJ still has his concealment thanks to Phantom, so he's able to scout ahead for us. No pods in sight. This is awesome. The hunter does spawn in, but he's on the other side of the map, and will be long gone before he poses any kind of threat to us, assuming that nothing goes wrong. Oh, look at that. KJ's flanked and gets shot at by two vipers. Wow, something went wrong immediately. Who saw that coming? KJ has thankfully just survived the hits he took, and the real question now is can everyone make it to the evac zone this turn? If they can, we're just going to run. But unfortunately, some of the troops are too far away. So instead, we run a little slower than as fast as we can, and drop some Mimic Beacons to keep the enemies off our back. On the next turn, we're then able to escape, and that was really close to being the perfect stealth mission. Ah oh well, it was still pretty good, I think. I'm feeling so confident I decide to hit the black site even though the warlock is still out there and is guaranteed to show up. We smoke the first pod and DJ remains in concealment. We scout ahead with him and come across the second pod. I set up an overwatch ambush but they don't take the bait and begin walking away. That is until the warlock summons in some psi zombies. They flank DJ which reveals him which in turn activates the pod. Normally, I'd be a bit salty about this, but it gets the pod to move into our overwatches and we do some decent damage, so I'm actually happy about it in this case. A turret and purifier survive our onslaught, but a mimic beacon protects us from them. We then wipe them out, place DJ back into concealment with the conceal ability he now has, and move on to the main facility. The warlock sends in some psi zombies to back up the usual pod in there, but we mop them all up. We do have to use up DJ's final concealment to do it though. Then we get a pod of a spectre and two mutons, and they take up cover in the furthest corner of the building, which is not great for our close combat favoring ranges. We also need to be wary of the mutons counterattack ability if we plan on making any melee attacks, which we don't, at least on the mutons. It's way too risky. As I said earlier, we do have an exosuit, and so we're able to blow one muton sky high with our heavy rocket. 
We can't take out the other two enemies, but you know the drill by now. Our Mimic Beacon has our back. Just as we finish off the pod, the Warlock arrives, but he doesn't actually attack when he activates. I guess he used all his action points on movement? I'm not sure, but I'll take it either way. However, he is quite far away, so we have limited opportunity to attack him back. He survives and summons a priest, which honestly seems like the perfect ability for him to have. He then brings in a spectral stun lancer too. And the warlock actually gets extra salty when you down a priest, if you didn't know. Is this what we're looking for? Well, I reckon it is. Pray for your offenses against the elders' holy servants. Yeah, like I'm gonna listen to a guy literally hiding in a bubble because he's so terrified of us. So I take out the stun lancer, but he still won't come out of his bubble to play. Turns out he actually summoned two spectrals, so we have to finish off the second one as well. We keep moving in on the warlock, but he keeps running away from us. It looks like he's going to survive this turn, as we have only one 24% chance shot with Cat left, but she pulls out a miracle and lands it. She was disoriented, and the warlock was in full cover. That was amazing. Cat you make the thumbnail. But now look where Advent drops its reinforcements in. Literally right on top of our evac zone. We claim this land first, you scumbags. Anyway, we book it out with the vial, and that's mission success. Next up is a retaliation mission, and we've got berserkers. I should also say we do have tactical analysis by this point, which is always a massive boost. Anyway, the first pod glitches out, and after taking some overwatch from us, they just stand there waiting for doom. Who needs cover anyway, isn't that right, Advent? We take out the whole pod on our turn, but soon run into another berserker, this time accompanied by mutons. Right after that, we meet a captain, shield bearer, and another muton. This is bad. Very, very bad. We used two Mimic Beacons to keep us safe, but on the alien turn, another pod activates with another Berserker. We're able to take out a couple of enemies, but on the next turn, one Mimic Beacon isn't enough to keep us safe. The beacon goes down, and we get hit with a Muton Grenade. Pyrotechnic is also pinned down with Suppression. Oh, and the Shield Bearer has buffed all the enemy's health. On our turn, we're only able to take down a single Muton. The Shield Bearer has really caused us some problems. Metla is able to flashbang all the remaining enemies, and none of them attack us, thankfully. But I'm looking at the health pools of these enemies. A Faceless is now active too, and I realize there's simply no way we're going to be able to take all their health to zero before they do it to us first. So I make the choice to evac out, losing the region, but keeping our soldiers alive. This is the first real butt kicking we've taken for this whole run, well, on this attempt at least. Just too many enemies activated at once, and we didn't have the means to take them down quickly enough. There is some good news though, as we unlock the improved weapon mods resistance order with a covert op. This is always a great ability to have. We also get a research breakthrough for improved damage on rifles. I'm not using any rifles at this stage, but I may later on, so we grab it. Before too long, it's time for the forge mission, as the avatar countdown has filled, and we need to reduce it. We blow our concealment on a turret, which may not have been the best idea in retrospect, but we have DJ with Shadow to scout ahead for us. Now the first pod walks off into a building, and I try to chase them down, only to be interrupted by the sector pod. These things really haven't wanted to waste any time in the last couple of videos. Anyway, we have blue screen rounds and six soldiers on the field by this stage, so we're able to bring the pain. Two grenades shred most of its armor, and we unload firepower until it's done. We do have to blow DJ's cover to take it out, but that's not a huge issue. The original pod returns, and we take it down, apart from the priest going into stasis. We try to overwatch him, but he doesn't move, and instead just goes for a mind control, so our overwatch is a bit of a fail. 
but the mind control also fails and then we take the priest down for good. We put DJ back into concealment and push on. We activate a pod of a codex and shield bearer. I try for a mimic beacon, but there must have been some weird line of sight issue as both enemies completely ignore it. So we get a psionic bomb and the shield bearer calls on his shield. We slash the shield bearer with drifter, but the rest of the squad isn't even close enough for a slash and the troops with run and gun can't help since they have to reload. I blow DJ's concealment again, leaving the shield bearer on 1 HP and throw down another mimic beacon with Leeson. Two mimic beacons for two not very difficult enemies. This has not gone very well whatsoever. And even better, three codexes and the hunter activate all at the same time. Oh, and the codexes have benefited from the shield too. Now interestingly, the hunter actually targets the mimic beacon. I thought the chosen always ignored it, so I'm not sure what happened there. We take out the shield bearer first, leaving the codexes vulnerable. DJ, thanks to blue screen rounds, one shots the first one. Drifter also has blue screen rounds and does the same thing. We take down one more, but the final codex remains and psionic bombs us. The hunter then hits two of the soldiers in the psionic bomb with his gas grenade, dazing them. DJ one-shots the codex and Drifter is able to revive the day soldiers so everyone can clear the blast zone. And then we start charging in for an up-close and personal meeting with the hunter. Well, he calls in some backup and then grapples onto a tower, getting a flank shot on Drifter and causing him to take bleed damage. If we don't heal this before his HP gets to zero, Drifter is finished. But of course, the problem with going up high is that a grenade can blow up the floor from under you. We charge in pretty recklessly with Cat and use Failed to heal Drifter. We use our last Mimic Beacon before Red Devil scores this insane critical hit and inflicts 19 damage on the Hunter, ending him right then and there. I was fully expecting him to have another turn to attack us, but this is a colossal win. Nicely done, Red Devil. We easily dispose of the Hunter's troopers on the next turn and push on, but we are out of concealment charges and mimic beacons, which could be a problem. But truth be told, it's not. There is another pod in the building, but we blitz through them. We then grab the body and head to the evac zone. Mission success with no real dramas. We build the frost bomb just in time for the UFO defense mission. And look at our roster for this one. Just about all the high level soldiers are tired, which is really not good. But I guess Advent aren't going to sit around and wait for a convenient time to come in and slaughter us, are they? I move the soldiers with concealment, KJ and DJ, to the left to hopefully sneak up on the disruptor beacon while moving everyone else to the right to take advantage of the high ground. But then I get this massive temptation. There's a pod of chrysalids that Leeson can slash, and because he has Blade Storm, when they scatter, he'll get free attacks on all of them. So I decide to be bold, and we charge out. We activate another pod of some mechs and a berserker, which causes me to break concealment with DJ. He has blue screen rounds, and those mechs are just asking for them. And I have to say, I'm not sure if I've ever come up with a strategy and then thrown it totally out the window so quickly before. Only a heavy mech and the Berserker survive, which we distract with a Mimic Beacon. Mimic Beacons will work on Berserkers, provided they haven't become enraged. If they have, I think you're out of luck. But there's always more Advent, isn't there? And so we get a Codex and Muton. We mop up more enemies, and only the Muton and Berserker survive. I freeze the Muton, hoping it will let our Ranger, Cowboy, sneak past it as he's still concealed. But no, frozen enemies have the same detection radius as regular enemies, so that's a bummer. I push on ahead way too aggressively. We were on a roof, so I thought we'd be safe, but turns out I was wrong, and Leeson activates two pods at once on a yellow dash, so we have no real way of defending ourselves. I am able to throw a mimic beacon onto the roof, which will hopefully protect the troops up there, 
and it kind of does. The Codex is able to hit the beacon and two soldiers with a psionic bomb, so that's exactly what it does. The rest of the enemies either overwatch or fire at the beacon. All things considered, that's actually a pretty good outcome. However, reinforcements are now being summoned, and that part is not good at all. But the great thing about the enemy overwatching is that most of our soldiers have shadow step, which means they don't trigger enemy overwatch. And the psionic bomb isn't the worst thing in the world, as we can still use our swords. So one heavy mech and two troops survive our counterattack, plus another heavy mech and stun lancer with the reinforcements. I used the last mimic beacon, so I'm feeling pretty good, only to have the mech one-shot it with a crit. So now Leeson is surrounded by two troopers with no protection. Well, the first trooper misses, and Leeson scores a blade storm on the second, taking it down. That was... well, there was no need to panic there as it turned out. And then on our turn, we go to town. A single heavy mech is all that survives, and it's actually shut down thanks to Cat's sword. But of course, the reinforcements are still dropping in on us. We're able to destroy the Disruptor, but the majority of the team are quite far from the Avenger. Meanwhile, Drifter, who was sent out as a reinforcement despite being injured, has his hands full with a mech and a priest. I position him next to the mech, so he'll finish it with Bladestorm on the enemy turn, but the priest has other ideas. It hits Drifter with sustain, so now the mech is safe to move and attack. And attack it does, hitting big damage on Failed. Failed has a morale check here, which he thankfully passes, but DJ and Cat, seeing Failed get wounded, also have to pass a morale check, and they both fail. So yeah, the guy named Failed succeeded, while DJ and Cat, well, failed. The irony is not lost on me. And this is the problem with sending tired troops out. Their will is lower than usual, so battle madness can really ruin your day. Now we've got two panicked soldiers that we can't move with, while reinforcements continue to drop in on us. All the while, we're trying to race back to the Avenger as fast as we can. This is a problem. Our remaining soldiers get lucky with some crits, and we take out all the enemies except for two priests. We flashbang one so we can't do much, but the second mind controls KJ. The good news is it took cover next to a car, so a grenade later and it's down to 1 HP. Gizmo, the wannabe Andromedon apparently, finishes it off. Thankfully, no sustain activation on this one. We then cut down the disoriented priest, and I don't believe they're able to go into stasis if they're disoriented. Anyway, the reinforcements by this point have dropped three stun lancers and a heavy mech. We need to get out of here fast, but too many of our troops are still just too far away. So we're forced to engage, and with the help of Bladestorm, we actually take out the whole pod of reinforcements. And it's not beating the enemies that's the problem, it's being able to get back to the Avenger. If we can't do that, we'll just be stuck here forever. So I decide we just have to run, and it's now every man and woman for themselves. If you can make it back to the ship, you get to live, and if you can't, well, we'll make a nice poster in remembrance of you that Bradford will probably talk smack about. Thankfully, we've fallen back far enough that the enemies can't seem to do much to us. Only one even attacks, and it's a miss. But we are getting completely swarmed at this point, and Gizmo almost gets left behind. She has one tile in the evac zone she can make it to this turn, so that's lucky for her. We then book it out of there, and everyone made it out alive. I honestly wasn't expecting that at the end there, but it's a win. Now we get some promotions to Major, and I plan to give everyone the untouchable ability. It just seems so much better than Deep Cover. So I do have a question for you all who are watching. Do any of you ever use Deep Cover? I don't think I've ever taken it on one of my ranges. We take some time to rest up the troops, but that does allow the Avatar progress to build back up. So it's then time to visit an alien facility, and there will of course be a ruler here. 
So we obliterate the first pod, but in doing so, trigger the second. I kind of expected this, as I had seen this pod move over in that direction earlier. It's only two enemies though, so I wasn't worried, unless they're standing right next to the Viper King. Well, for whatever reason, he actually doesn't activate, even though the pod does. So this creates the problem that we can't charge in for close combat without activating the king. I instead opt to distract the pod with a mimic beacon and hope the king doesn't come this way. Oh, never mind, he's coming this way immediately. And get this, the regular viper apparently can't see the mimic beacon, so it pulls pyrotechnic in for a cuddle. Now Ratlord has the frost bomb, but the king is too far away for him to make the throw. DJ one-shots the codex, and then the king goes for KJ. KJ does hit with Bladestorm, but this causes some placement shenanigans, where it looks like the king is in one place, even though he's actually not. And this, of course, makes using the frost bomb basically impossible. I charge Leeson in with a slash, and the king uses some AoE frost attack to freeze everything around him, I'm not sure I've seen this attack before. And I think it froze the regular Viper too, which would be great news for Pyrotechnic, but I'm not actually sure. I mean, the Viper didn't attack on its turn, so I guess it's incapacitated. Anyway, the King seems to be moving around a lot and not attacking us very much. I'm totally fine with this, for the record. Then we charge him with Red Devil, who stuns on the Blade Storm, so we've got a reprieve. So the regular Viper thaws out, and this time wants to get acquainted with Ratlord. And another pod activates as well. So we hit the King with another slash, but we actually stun him again. And even though he's stunned, we still get to hit him again with Bladestorm. That doesn't seem very fair, but I'll take it all the same. But the unfairness is spread fairly, I guess and apparently the king isn't stunned, even though the game just told me that he is. He gets to activate his portal and flee, with no blade storms activating. Maybe it can only activate once per turn on a given enemy, or maybe it was because of the earlier stun when we attacked and we shouldn't have, I don't know. Either way, he's out of here. On one hand, this is annoying, but on the other, he only has 2 HP, so he'll go down easily the next time we run into him. And of course, with the king gone, the rest of the enemies are easily disposed of. We plant the X4 and head on home. Also, we're now able to use the resistance order that reduces avatar progress by one each month. That's going to help us avoid being forced into these facility missions before we're ready in the future. Before long, we have a Gorilla Op, and we have Fusion Blades by this point. The Viper King does return for his revenge, but immediately gets wiped out by an Overwatch from Cat. It was a pretty anticlimactic end for him, if I'm being honest. But whatever, some time passes, and things continue going quite well. I mean, there's some annoying things that happen, like this. I'm one supply short of building another Mimic Beacon. One. This is brutal. Anyway, next we set out to Skulljack Codex. So we charge out with Pyrotechnic to hit the first pod with some Bladestorm fun, but you know what isn't fun? Activating a Sector Pod. Yes, we're seeing them on regular missions, that's how far into the game we are. It really doesn't feel like we've made that much progress. So we burn through all three Mimic Beacons while we try to stave off this Sector Pod and its buddies. The plan mostly works, as we're able to take out the Sector Pod and the other enemies, while only getting hit a single time by a turret. However, we are out of Mimic Beacons now, so we'll have to be careful as we go forward. Well, the next pod is two Spectres and a Codex, just what we need for our Skulljack. We're able to take out one of the Spectres, but it immediately gets replaced by a Faceless. Yes, the Alien Infiltrator's Dark Event was active again. The Codex uses a Psy Bomb, but the Spectre thankfully only goes for an Overwatch. I'm not sure why it did that. Maybe we were too far out of range for it to use its abilities. We take out the Faceless. I spare the Codex as I want a Skulljacket at the start of next turn. 
and the Spectre were just not able to eliminate. The Codex and Spectre both target Cowboy, and the Spectre makes a clone of him. But one sword attack later, and the Spectre and clone are both gone. And now for the main event, let's summon in that avatar. And I had been saving the Frost Bomb for this very moment. It stops the avatar from teleporting, so taking it down is just a matter of swinging enough swords. We grab the enemy VIP, blow a hole in the wall, and run to the evac zone, while a very angry faceless and some reinforcements chase us down. Everyone thankfully makes it out alive, and this is mission success. We build the serpent armor and give it to KJ, and look how cool this thing looks in red and black. Very nice. And the reason I've given it to KJ is because he has serial as a hidden ability. Once activated, it means every kill shot refunds an action point. I also equip him with a rifle, scope, and perception PCS to boost his aim as high as we can. The height advantage from the grapple will add to this as well. We also give him some venom rounds to add a bit of extra firepower. And now it's off to the warlocks we go with beam weapons in tow. Now have you ever seen a berserker and chrysalid run right into a wall of bladestorm rangers? Well you have now. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So yeah, that's the first pod done and dusted. The second pod also has a berserker. This one we do need to use a mimic beacon on to give us time to finish it off, but we take all the enemies down easily enough. And this process continues our whole way to the elevator. We see a pod, we annihilate it, and then we move on to rinse and repeat. We're doing incredibly well, and I don't think any of these soldiers have even reached colonel level yet. Ranges are pretty good it seems. And look at this, Cat one-shotting a codex with a blade. We're really not messing around here. We eliminate the enemies in the final chamber, and now the real battle begins. The Warlock is here, and he's immune to explosions by this point. But hey, still better than immune to melee, so there's no complaints from me. A grenade will still shred and destroy his cover though, and from there, we inflict big damage. But he manages to survive with a single point of HP. Now he is poisoned thanks to our venom rounds, so he's definitely going down next turn. But in the meantime, he summons in two priests. He also gets burned when he moves. Imagine being poisoned and on fire. Oof. Both priests get sustain, but our bladestorm rangers are in place to deal with that. And now the warlock goes down to poison. I could have finished him on my turn, but by waiting for the poison to act on his turn, it means no reinforcements will warp in. That gives us more time to deal with the sarcophagus. One of the priests hits Cat with Sustain, which is annoying. Apparently Sustain doesn't activate Bladestorm. That's good to know, I guess. The other priest is less fortunate, however, and gets sliced and diced by Drifter and Leeson. We wipe out the remaining priest, and then turn our full attention to the sarcophagus. And we do a bit over half damage by the time reinforcements finally arrive. There's a priest and Andromedon, and we haven't really seen too many Andromedons in this run. I was quite enjoying that, I have to admit. We're able to destroy the sarcophagus, and we use a mimic beacon to keep the bad guys off our back, as usual. Well, mostly the Andromedon, as the priest falls to a blade storm anyway. Now since the Warlock only has 50% health when he returns, we take him down with only a few attacks. Normally the first chosen assault is quite difficult, but that one was... well, that one really wasn't difficult. Once the research on the Warlock's rifle is complete, we equip it on KJ. I then give KJ's old rifle to DJ, as they're our top two stealth rangers. So without any sword enhancements, I figure rifles with aim buffs might be more useful on them. This way not everyone is having to get up close and personal to maximise their attack strength. But with one chosen down, we now have to enter the Assassin's Territory. We kick things off by taking out a Stun Lancer in one shot. Well, I guess technically it was two because we used Rapid Fire. Normally I'd go for the Purifier first, as it has a chance to explode and damage the rest of the pod, but they're standing right on top of the VIP we're trying to rescue, 
so this is one of the rare times when we don't want to make things go boom. We take out the rest of the pod and the assassin then debuts. She's immune to melee, and I'm sure you remember how that went with the warlock earlier in the video. We take all the Archons down this turn, and KJ is still concealed, and even better, he finds where the assassin is hiding. We hit her with a rocket, and then blast away. We're doing huge damage, and we actually take her out before she can attack us once. That was awesome. Two Faceless then reveal, but we one-shot one of them with an Overwatch. I am annoyed that the Faceless keep spawning on missions where we have to evac, as it means we don't get to keep the bodies for our precious Mimic Beacons. Advent do send some reinforcements, but they don't cause us any problems either, and we return to the Sky Ranger with the VIP. Everyone is safe and sound. We have a Gorilla Op, and this is what happens when Bladestorm goes wrong. I surround this sector pod with Bladestorm Rangers. I know it will explode and damage us when we destroy it, but we can survive the hit. Unless it gets to attack before Bladestorm activates, that is. Then we take a hit from the sector pod and take another hit when it detonates, and we actually lose Metla here. It's rare that we lose soldiers this late in the campaign, but it's happened here. Rest easy, Metla. I'm sure we'll see you again in the next challenge run. Or right now, thanks to the recruitment pool glitch. I really love that glitch. Of course, he's back to rookie level, but our man Metla is back, and that's cause for celebration. And what I think happened is that the first attack the Sectopod did didn't trigger Bladestorm, just like Stasis from the Priest earlier. Then the Sectopod either attacked a second time or tried to move, and that does trigger Bladestorm, and hence one deceased ranger for us. And the worst part is the Sectopod only had one HP left. If just one of our many attacks had done a single extra point of damage, we would have been fine. But let's put that behind us, build some Warden armor, and then go after the Hunter. The first pod is easy enough, apart from the fact Drifter misses with a Blade Storm, so gets shot. Now he does survive, but on the next turn, the slash chance to hit is 99%. Does this mean the Blade Storm chance to hit was also 99% and we missed? If so, I just... Well, I have no words. We get some more ridiculous luck. We miss three Blade Storms in a row and a Stun Lancer then ignores the Mimic Beacon to attack Drifter instead. It at least misses too. I guess it didn't have line of sight on the Beacon from where it started its turn and that's why it didn't attack it. Either way, your boy Drifter is having a pretty bad time this mission. There's not too much else to say on our way to the elevator. Just a lot of swords swinging and advent soldiers screaming in agony. The enemies in the chamber are no big deal, so bring out the hunter. He has acquired the planewalker ability by this point, and every time he gets this, it ends up being a pain. I'm sure that will be no different here, especially given we're using close range soldiers. But DJ's rapid fire proves to be the difference maker here as he inflicts massive damage. As in, well over half the hunter's HP with rapid fire. That's excellent. We take the hunter down surprisingly easily and then focus on the sarcophagus as usual, but you know the drill by now. We can't take it out and so we get some reinforcements. But here, for some reason that is inexplicable to me as I watch this footage back, I actually went after the reinforcements instead of focusing on the sarcophagus and using a meme beacon. I really can't fathom why I did this. There's no point as more reinforcements are just going to keep coming. Eventually I come to my senses and we're still able to destroy the sarcophagus this turn. Let's call it a bout of temporary insanity. Yeah, that's right temporary. Anyway, we don't have rapid fire this time as it's on cooldown, and I believe when the game first launched, there was no cooldown for rapid fire. It simply depended on you having enough ammunition in the gun to use the ability. Man, those were some good times. Anyway, the hunter only has 50% HP, so he is terminated. And truth be told, that was really easy. 
Having the swords really negated Planewalker, as we were always able to dash to the hunter and attack no matter where he teleported to. And having the soldiers spread out across the chamber really helped with this. But speaking of Terminators, Larissa Terminator Hoffman has Death From Above as a hidden ability. I kid her out with a high accuracy rifle, a wraith suit for the grapple, and a perception PCS. Meanwhile, Red Devil now has Rapid Fire and Shred, which is a lethal combination. And we research plus one damage on our beam weapons. Things just got a lot worse for Advent. Needless to say, things go well for the next few missions. But then it's time to hit the Assassin's base. We use Serial to mop up some Spectres, but one survives. I could take it out with DJ, but one Spectre on its own isn't too much of a threat, and I'd rather keep DJ's concealment for now. The surviving Spectre just repositions on its turn, so yeah, like I said, not much of a threat. We breeze through this section, though we do get slowed down by the pod in the elevator room, an Andromedon and a couple of Sectoids, but a Mimic Beacon keeps us safe before we finish off the whole pod. Cat also has Shred at this stage, which is proving very beneficial, and I'm making an effort to try and rack up kills on the soldiers who aren't colonels yet, so they get the extra XP. The enemies waiting for us in the chamber are a Codex and Sectoid, and to be perfectly honest, I actually feel kind of bad for them. They never stood a chance against us at this point. But now the assassin arrives, and this could be annoying since she's immune to melee, but then again, I think everyone on the team has run and gun by this point, so not being able to melee isn't much of a problem. We can just yellow dash and then shoot instead. Now here something weird happens. Remember in the Reapers only run, how we couldn't use Banish against the Sarcophagus? Well here, Leeson can use Rapid Fire on it, but the second shot appears to do nothing. I'm not sure if this was a glitch or something, but it wasted a rapid fire use. I'm really not happy about that. A Berserker and Chrysalid spawn in, but Drifter one-shots the lid with Bladestorm. We leave the Berserker on 1 HP. It's burning and susceptible to two Bladestorms on the next turn, so it should go down, no worries. Meanwhile, we knock the Sarcophagus out of commission for good. The Assassin, again with a mere 50% health, returns, but quickly goes invisible. I go searching for her with Failed, and accidentally wind up right next to her. It was kind of creepy when she revealed right on top of him like that, I do have to admit. Proper horror movie material right there. We blow her up and her cover with a grenade, and then shoot until our trigger fingers are sore. No more chosen for us. And being able to use the Assassin's gun and katana is going to be awesome. More time passes and we're now heading into the Psionic Gate mission. We've already fought multiple gatekeepers by this point for the record. Now I usually go with battle scanners on this mission, as anyone who has watched my previous videos will know. But I'm opting for a different approach on this one. And I'll tell you all about it in a second. But first, check out our inventory here. Six soldiers, all of them carrying a Mimic Beacon. I hope you all like cheese, because I'm about to be laying it down all over the place. Let's go. So my brilliant strategy for this mission? Well, let me tell you all about it. It's pretty complex, so make sure that you pay attention. It goes like this. We send out Drifter first. Yep, that's the strat. Got it? Good. And allow me to demonstrate. These three enemies are standing together, and we send in Drifty Boy for some Bladestorm fun. You'll notice he's doing big damage, and his attacks appear to be ignoring the soldier's armor. And that's because they are ignoring the soldier's armor. See, he's using the Assassin's Blade. Not only does it have armor piercing, just like AP ammo, but it never misses. It doesn't matter how high your enemy's defense is, you're connecting with that Slash or Blade Storm. I'm not sure if Spectre's Lightning Reflex counters it though, I need to look into that. Meanwhile, Cat has the Assassin's Shotgun, which is also amazing, but for this mission in particular, the sword really shines. And this Katana is the reason I've waited so long before tackling this mission. 
So between the high damage, armor piercing, and never missing, Drifter is guaranteed to one-shot any chrysalids who come at him. We just watch as time and time again, they throw themselves to their deaths trying to attack him. So there's no need for battle scanners, or overwatch, or anything else. We just make Drifter go first, and it's guaranteed victory against the chrysalids. There are obviously other enemies though, namely the gatekeeper. This is what we've saved our blaster launchers for, which we have multiple of by this point. And not only does Failed make a 58% shot here, he gets a hair trigger activation and makes the same shot again. What a complete lad. So this one's over, Rangers are the best class for this particular battle, especially with the Assassin's Blade, so this was a breeze. And I soon decide it's time to end this campaign and hit the Network Tower mission. I know there's still two rulers out there, and we could take their armor, but I honestly don't think we need them. Our rangers are already so absurdly powerful that I can't imagine Advent is going to be able to do anything against us. So we might as well save ourselves the time and just hit the final mission. Now if that mission goes horribly wrong and we get squad wiped, I'll be happy to eat my words, but right now I'm confident that the rangers have this one in the bag. We get an intel bonus that allows us to take a fourth soldier on the network tower, I always love rolling that one. I send Pyrotechnic, Red Devil, Monocle, and Hoffman. And I really talked up Hoffman's death from above earlier, but she hasn't had the chance to show it off in this video yet, so maybe this is her time to shine. Well, how about one-shotting a Muton and then finishing off an Andromedon twice in the one turn? Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good effort. And truth be told, she did save our hides in quite a few missions, but if I covered every single mission in the campaign, these videos would be 8 hours long. We blast our way through a few more pods, none of them prove much of a challenge for us. We hack the objective, and then turn our attention to the final, final mission. We only bring a single grenade, but we do have 3 blaster launches and 5 mimic beacons, so lacking on the grenade front should be worth it. And I say this every video, but for new viewers, we're not allowed to use the commander's avatar on this mission. He's not a ranger, so he's not allowed to participate in combat. He just has to hang back and chill out. We got this one, commander. No need for you to worry. So in the specialist run, we went slow and steady, using our amazing overwatch to our advantage. Well, here, slow and steady is not the way to go. At least I don't think so. We charge forward and activate two pods. One is just an Archon and some Mutons, no big deal, but the other is a Gatekeeper and a swarm of Chrysalids. Hmm, what to do here? Well, I haven't shown off the Reaper ability in this video yet, have I? So let's activate it on Drifter and send him neck deep into those Chrysalids. Drifter cuts quite a few of them down to size and KJ uses a Rapid Fire on the Gatekeeper destroying it from full health. Lo and behold, the power of Shred combined with the Warlock's rifle. Absolute devastation. I should also mention here, just about everyone on the team has Implacable. Now Implacable lets you move after finishing off an enemy. It appears on the stealth side of the ability tree, but it's actually really useful for Blademaster Rangers. They can take someone out and then move next to another enemy to get a free blade storm on them on the next turn. And I always felt run and gun and implacable should be swapped on the skill tree. Implacable should be a sword ranger's ability, run and gun should be a stealth ranger's ability. What do you guys think about this idea? I mean, it doesn't matter now with War of the Chosen because we can choose both abilities, but in the base game it did annoy me. Some Archons come at us, but they're no match. The next pod is a different story though. A whole squad of mechs, including some heavies. Now they're a bit far away for us to deal with effectively, so we fall back and force them to come to us. We do still have tactical analysis after all. Some of the mechs take the bait, but some don't. But this time we activate Reaper with Cat, and we go to town. All the mechs are vanquished, and we're ready to push on. I guess they weren't that threatening after all. 
And to be honest, I'm feeling a bit too cocky at this point and push forward faster than what is sensible. We run right into two berserkers. We've used up half our squad's actions, which means they can't attack, but I decide to be a little bit devious and I throw out a little trap. Cat uses the mimic beacon and we place Drifter right next to it while also putting KJ on Overwatch. So when the Berserker moves in to melee the Mimic Beacon, she gets a Blade Storm to her oversized face. Between that and the Overwatch, she only has 1 HP left. The second Berserker can't actually reach the Beacon due to tactical analysis. I was hoping to slash her as well, but it's no big deal. We mop them both up on the next turn, and I think we still have 4 Mimic Beacons left. Now DJ still has concealment even this late into the mission and he spies another pot of mechs. It's not often you get two of them on this level. At least I don't think it is. You know the deal. Grab a Bladestorm Ranger and charge them full speed ahead. Oh, it doesn't work so well if none of the bad guys scatter. These mechs can't use cover anyway, so I guess they've caught onto my strategy. They just stand around taunting my lack of ability to bladestorm them since they're not moving. Machine learning, I tell ya, it's a scary thing. Anyway, same deal as usual. We bang bang and stab stab until there's nothing left standing. But then it's time for things to get interesting. Two sector pods and their mech underlings. We move in as close as we can without activating the pod. We just need to be close enough to be able to use our melee skills. And my goodness, what are these robots doing? They've gone to the furthest end of the level. It kind of looks like they're banging on the door, begging to be let into the final chamber because they're so terrified of what's about to happen to them. And I mean, they're right to be terrified. Cue the destruction music. Alright, now it's time for the big showdown. I place KJ back into concealment and he scouts ahead. Meanwhile, I move the other rangers in as close as possible without activating the bad guys, just like we did with the sector pods. And I believe the avatar will just stand around indefinitely as long as you don't activate it. So if you need to take some turns for your abilities to recharge or to get into the right position, feel free to do so. And look at this utter ridiculousness. Drifter puts on his Olympic sprint and he hits the avatar, but he gets to hit it again with Bladestorm. The big bad has only just activated and it's already down to 4 HP. Well, make that 0 HP once Leeson has his say. The Archon dodges Cat's attacks and survives with 1 HP, but we inflict burning so it's gone next turn anyway. No dodge cheese for you today, Archon. I'm not sorry. DJ blasts the second in the face, and no Archons for us to worry about. 
We have a pod of sectoids drop in, which is fine, and a pod of codexes, which could prove a little more annoying. But I'll tell you, it's reaping season for failed, as he single-handedly wipes out all the sectoids. KJ, Drifter, and Leeson, meanwhile, handle the codexes. The aliens used there were all going to warp in on the same side of the map, trick again, and the Avatar is rocking Andromedons in his retinue. So they're taking this pretty seriously. Well, a blaster launcher sends the Avatar teleporting away from the rest of his crew, and a couple more attacks, we take it down. And I decide just to abandon the alien side of the map. There's too many enemies with just too much HP, so I run as far away as we can. There's no way we're going to be able to take them all down in a single turn. But both Andromedon's target failed and take him out. DJ, who has a bond with failed, see I use bonds again, goes berserk and starts unloading on the aliens. He misses all but one. Yep, a way to show Advent with that display, bud. I'm sure they'll think twice before messing with us again. More faceless spawn in, but I focus on the Andromedons. We're not letting them get away with this. We pound them with damage, even using a blaster bomb, and they don't last very long. We avenged you failed. Rest easy, brother. Well, at least until the next campaign when you'll be back. Oh, but we're not done. Those faceless that spawned in, they can eat a reaper from Drifter, who wipes out the whole pod. Okay, the final avatar is here. As always, it's the one and only priority. We get another weird placement glitch that leads me thinking I've put Drifter right next to the avatar, even though I apparently haven't. It's not a big deal though, as we still hit with one of the shots from Rapid Fire. And then one more Rapid Fire from KJ, and this one is in the bag. So this was a weird run. Absolutely brutal in the very early game, probably the hardest that I've done, even harder than the Templars. Five failed attempts, and the majority of them were in the very first mission. But by the end of the game, well, you saw it for yourself. The specialists were OP by the late game, but these rangers went even beyond that with their dominance. It should also be noted, to be fair, that getting those extra mimic beacons early in the game gave the rangers a huge boost for the rest of the campaign, so it's not an entirely fair comparison. But that being said, rangers are a really good class, so I expected them to do well. And they sure didn't let me down. In fact, rangers may be the best of the four base classes. But then again, maybe not. Maybe there's another class that might have something to say about that. Yes, that's right. Next time, it's Grenadiers only. I know some of you have been waiting for this one, and I'm looking forward to it as well. Valen is no doubt going to lose her mind because there's going to be chaos. Oh, and explosions. Lots of explosions. So I hope you'll subscribe to the channel and join me for that one. And if you like this video, please leave a like and a comment. As always, if you made it this far, thanks a lot for watching. Have a great day, and I hope to see you next time. Losing time, I'm fading fast. I just wanna make it last. Try to let go of the past. I close my eyes, embrace the blast. Sleepless nights and headaches stack. Restlessness to hell and back. What's my purpose? What do I grab? A slippery surface, a heart attack. And sometimes you just gotta believe. There's something that'll give you relief. There's something that'll have what you need. What you need.